I'm a, I'm a little reluctant to go through everybody's uh, bios, but let me just give a brief uh, a brief. So Simon, who's joining us via Zoom, is from Copenhagen, Copenhagen, Denmark. He graduated as a documentary film director from the National School of Denmark in 2009. His first feature, The Distant Barking of Dogs, premiered at the IDFA and was awarded Best First Appearance. <clears throat> Sean Xen, right here to my left, from All That Breathes, is a filmmaker and scholar based in New Delhi, India. Cities of Sleep in 2016 was his first feature-length documentary shown at many international film festivals and has won six international awards. He was a visiting scholar at Cambridge in 2018 and has published academic articles in Bioscope and many other journals. Welcome, Shanak. Laura Poitras, down at the end, uh, received an Academy Award for her film, Citizen Four. Many of us know that. Her reporting on the NSA's global mass surveillance received the Pulitzer Prize as well. Her film about the US occupation of Iraq, My Country, My Country, was nominated for an Oscar. And her 2021 film, Terror Contagion, was part of an anthology executive produced by Jafar Panahi, who I think is out of jail now, right? Yeah. Laura has been targeted by the US government for her work documenting post 9 11 America. In 2006, she was placed on a secret terrorist watch list and detained dozens of times, but they let her out. <laughs> okay. I, I was never imprisoned, um, just detained. Just detained. Sarah Dosa is an Indie Spirit Award nominated documentary director and Peabody Award winning producer whose interests lay in telling unexpected character driven stories about the ecology, economy, and community. Her first feature as a director the last season won a Golden Gate Award at its SFIFF premiere and was nominated for the Indie Spirit Truer Than Fiction Award. And finally, Daniel Rohr from Navalny. His films have taken him to every corner of the globe, most recently to direct Navalny. Um, the film premiered at the 2022 Sundance Film Festival and received the audience and festival favorite awards. Prior to Navalny, Daniel wrote and directed Once Were Brothers, Robbie Robertson, and the band, his feature documentary debut. So we have just an incredibly accomplished group of documentary filmmakers at the, working at the top of their craft, and I'm excited to hear about your journeys and why you chose the various subjects you did I'll start with Laura, who's the only person I've met bef earlier <laughs> on this panel. Um, you, as I mentioned, you're known for writing about um, political, um, writing about, sorry, for making films about political, uh, international political topics. And this is about the Nan Gold in your film, All the Beauty and the Bloodshed, uh, and the, the artist and photographer, and the Purdue Sackler family. So y there, for you, there's a connection there, right? There, y th that's a, on a continuum with your work or, or a, a break from your previous work? Um, well, first of all, it's really wonderful to be here with these other nominees whose films I love. It's a really incredible group of films and also unique and really coming from a position of artistry. So um, yeah, there was a, there were the, the obvious um, through line for me was um, the kind of contemporary unfolding in real time uh, battle of Nan Golden, you know, taking taking on the Sackler family that felt consistent, you know, sort of looking at U.S. power, and so that was the sort of that was my entry into it, and then the different layers of the film emerged once I started working with Nan, who goes to places emotionally that a lot of people don't go to, and the sort of layering um, of her more of her personal life wasn't the first entry; per f that it was more the contemporary piece of the, the her fight. Had you been looking for a topic, or had you been following the Sackler family saga, which was very infuriating to a lot of people, not just yeah. Nan Golden? I, I mean, I tend to do uh, make films through following somebody, like looking at larger social issues, but through somebody else. So I wasn't. It wasn't that I was like looking to make a film about the overdose crisis, even though, of course, if you're from the U.S., you you're very aware of it. Um, it's been devastating. Um, but I was struck by Nan was using her position in the art world, and she, this is somebody who's very renowned, and she was using it to critique the institutions that she's working in. And so that, for me, that was the entry point. And you, you were using, 
you had the benefit of some of the footage that she'd already taken before. Like you didn't right. come in at the beginning yeah, I mean, of this, right. right? She is. I mean, she's a collaborator, and that's a, a, another very um, difference between my previous film is how much of a collaborator a collaborator she is. She began the film. She's a producer on the film, and so she began the filming of the of the protests, and then brought me on, invited me to join. And and how did you get her? I would think that the biggest issue there would be just the trust that sure. she, as somebody who has a very particular point of view as an artist, that she would have to hand that over to you as the right. director? Right. I mean, you know, Nan says often that she makes photographs because she wants to tell a history of her life that nobody can change and re-edit. I mean, like that, that's, so yeah, it, it was a big deal for her to, to collaborate and that's, um, uh, how did you get her to trust you? How did that? It, well, I wouldn't describe it as get her. I mean, it was an organic process. I mean, trust happens over time. And um, uh, I think she, you know, we also, she has a lot of agency in the film. Not that, I mean, I have final cut on the film. It's, you know, I'm the director of the film. But of course, I wanted it to be, to be truthful for her as well. Um, so we, um, at, once we had a rough cut, we, we shared the cut with her and, and she had notes and they were all notes that sort of made it deeper. It wasn't anything that was coming out of the film, but like she wanted to add more depth to some of the story threads, like about her sister, Barbara and, and others. Yeah. That's one of the things I really, really love about your film is that it's not a film, um, that is a, at all a conventional telling of an artist's activism and success in getting museums to remove the Sackler name. A lot of the um, wonder of the film for me was discovering Nan Golden's work, which um, shame on me <laughs> that I didn't know better, but it's like, it's almost like uh, another half of the film, right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. To me, it's the core of the film is, is, is that uh, the, her story and, um, and f hopefully a story about uh, like why artists make work and from a very from a point of finding a voice in the world I mean like when she talks about getting a camera and that's the way that she found her voice I hope that that's one of the things that the film and d and sorry if this is a simplistic question but did you go into the film knowing that that was going to be your structure did you know that you were going to tell her story as an artist we, you know, also. we knew it was going to touch on that, um, and I knew that there would be some historical parallels because of her work that she did and during the, having lived through two crises and the, the AIDS crisis and now the overdose crisis. I knew that the, there would be a convergence of those two, two historical moments in the film yeah. at, the, at the very beginning. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that's so unexpected about this film and, and really delightful. Uh, Sarah, let's talk a little bit about your film, please. <laughs> um, so y you made Fire of Love. It's about these two French volcanologists. What the heck? Like, where? Like, how did that start? <laughs> uh, it's that like such a, it's such a, I want to say random, but it's like, and it's so amazing. The footage is incredible. And the, the story that you weave together of their relationship is incredible. But where'd that come from? Yeah. Well, first, I, I love the what the heck. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about them. Yeah. They still feel like surreal characters to me, but they were very, very real. Um, my team and I first got to know Katya and Maurice Kraft, our, our protagonists, actually when we were doing research for the last film I directed. That's a film entitled The Seer and the Unseen. Um, and it's a verite documentary that takes place in Iceland, which is a volcanic island. And we think of Seer and the Unseen as a, uh, a, magic real, uh, a magically real documentary. We wanted to open it with footage that could really speak to um, this world of creation and destruction that volcanoes represent. And, and we started doing research on volcanic um, imagery and archives of erupting volcanoes in Iceland. And that's how we first learned about Katya and Maurice Kraft. We were so struck by the power of their imagery. There was nothing uh, like it I had seen before. It was so surreal and magical. But once we learned that they were a couple, a married couple in love with each other and so passionately in love with the earth, we thought that there was a real story here. And for me as a filmmaker, I'm really drawn to stories um, about the human relationship with non-human nature, especially stories that can kind of center like the sentience or, or the power of the natural world. Um, and I also just delight in 
and people <laughs> and human characters. And so in, in this kind of milieu, it, it seemed like everything I was always dreaming of in a, in a story. Um, these characters that had this kind of mythic love for each other and this elemental force. And the more we got to know them, the more excited we were to tell their story, uh, specifically using the um, profound imagery uh, that they themselves took. So how many hours of footage should you actually have to go through to craft the story that you did? We worked with about 250 hours of footage. Mm -hmm. uh, about 200 of those hours were um, uh, 16 millimeter footage that Katya and Maurice themselves shot, and thousands of still photographs that largely Katya herself took. And then there was about 50 hours uh, of Katya and Maurice appearing in front of other people's cameras. They were celebrities, in, in especially in France uh, at that time when, when they were alive. From um, you know, they were really well known, especially in the 70s and 80s. But they appeared on the news on really fun variety shows from the 70s. They had their own children's show, actually, for a little bit. Um, so that material uh, was extremely useful for us to, to get to work with, too. Uh, they also authored nearly 20 books, and we pulled in their writings, uh, specifically Katya's writings, because she was left out of a lot of the visual record. Um, it's a whole other topic for conversation. Uh, but it was really wonderful to get to work with their words, uh, as well as their, their imagery. Are you saying that she was ignored because she was the female part of the couple? She Cameras were very much trained on, on Maurice for, um, mm -hmm. due to all kinds of reasons, um, sexism definitely being one of them. Um, there's some footage that we came across where, you know, for, one, for example, there's like a, a, a panel discussion happening and the host says, oh, we're so lucky here with us today. We have a legendary scientist and adventurer, Maurice Kraft, and his wife, Katya. Um, and you can oh, just wow. see like the jaw on her you know, face just tighten. And Katya had seen more active volcanoes than Maurice, had published more than he had. And for her to be thought as you know, kind of this accessory uh, to him, um, it's devastating. And it's an experience that's very sadly so many women can uh, recognize. Um, and that, uh, that proved to be true in, in the visual record. There's a lot more of Maurice. Um, he also liked to be in front of the camera a lot more. Uh, Katya hated it, and for good reason. I would hate that, too, if that happened to me. Um, but uh, she was a prolific writer, and we were able to use a lot of her words to kind of rebalance the archive in a way that it felt kind of like restoring an, a, an injustice, so to speak, um, and getting to make her uh, just as present as Maurice in, in our film. That's a great thing to have done, kind of surreptitiously without, without you know, making a, a big deal out of it, that that's great to have re sort of rebalance the scales in terms of their accomplishment. But it, uh, beyond that, the images are, I, I mean, it's like you watch the film and you uh, kind of can't believe what you're seeing. Like, is that, uh, can, I, can I layer on top of that some CG, you know, Middle Earth <laughs> movie that's, you know, did you have that experience when you were looking at the footage for the first time? It was uh, absolutely stunning and surreal. I remember the first reel I got, um, I should say we, we made this during the, pan we, I'm sure we we're all making our, our work during the pandemic. Um, for me, I started to watch their footage. Um, it was being scanned and, and sent over to the internet uh, from the archival house in France to, to my little apartment at that time in San Francisco. And I got one reel of uh, footage from Hawaii in, in 1984. And I remember looking at this close-up shot of this lava just bubbling and oozing and dripping. And I just thought, how alive, you know, how utterly mysterious and alive our Earth is. And there's this quote that Maurice has in the film where he talks about how at, at this very moment, as you're watching these images, there's at least 30 erupting volcanoes all around the world. And it just makes me think like, like our planet <laughs> is, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's so, it's, it seems so otherworldly. It's the fact that this exists, it's, it's um, I, I feel like it expands, or at least for me, it, it, I had the experience of just my mind expanding in this way where it opened up into possibility and the unknown. And it made me think about uh, Katya and Maurice and kind of their yearning for discovery and to see images like this uh, constantly. Um, so it was a wonderful experience in that one moment. Um, and I, I feel like that experience was something that myself and, and my phenomenal editors and, and my producing team uh, had time and time again. It, mu it must have been really hard to choose. For if, the, if, if anybody here hasn't seen the movie, like you have the links, you, should, you must see them. But just in particular, the image of 
the burning lava in the water. It, you know, you're watching this glowing, burning thing actually underwater, and it's like, that's not possible, but you're like looking at it. It's just. Yeah, that was some of our favorite footage, and, and particularly how like land is literally being created there. And <sighs> that's something that Kachi and Maurice would talk about all the time. Is they're not just volcanoes are not just beautiful. They're not just the subject of scientific inquiry. Uh, they're the forces of creation and destruction. Yeah. And creation again, there's something divine and transcendent about uh, how they viewed volcanoes, and that really shows in their photography. Yeah. Um, you can feel that 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 power, that sense, and and those images specifically the underwater ones um, it's like that's becoming like an, a new island uh, and it's also just yeah I can't take my eyes off of it yeah I, I think if you've seen it you can never you can't you can't forget it if you've seen it and it's just riveting um, so let's go from lavas let's go up to Copenhagen and let Simon talk since he stayed up for us thank you um, you know that there's nothing uh, scale-wise farther than kind of the, the look on the children's face faces in a house made of splinters uh, compared to Fire of Love um, from the grandeur of nature down to like the, the most granular human scale. Um, you discovered this, um, it's not quite an orphanage, it's, uh, it's kind of like an orphanage, right? The, this place that takes care of children in Eastern Ukraine, is that right? Yeah, it's, it's a state-run temporary shelter where they take kids for the nine months that the state have to uh, decide their case. And how did you go from Copenhagen to and f find that story in that place and decide to spend, spend your life working on a st that story? Actually, <clears throat> it was before. Uh, it was my previous film uh, as kind of a re result of that one. I started back in... 2016 to document the lives of a of a young kid and his grandma living you know right on the edge of the of the trenches of the war in eastern ukraine uh, and i got very close to this art uh, but very lovable uh, couple and in the latest stages of shooting that film which is called the, the distant barking of dogs uh, the grandma got uh, ill um, and i was super worried uh, that if she were to pass away, what would happen to her amazing young uh, grandchild? Um, luckily, she didn't, and and she recovered, and they're doing great today. Um, but but that question, it, it, it couldn't kind of uh, escape my mind. Um, so when all of the things was done with this film, also in a way to kind of prepare myself because it was a heart condition and. Uh, no telling if, if it would be back again. Uh, we wanted to figure it out. Uh, what 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 actually does happen to kids in this situation? And are there many kids in that situation where they're left without anybody uh, really being able to take care of them? So I asked my amazing assistant director, uh, the Ukrainian Asad Safarov, to, uh, to to try see if he could just do a little bit of digging and and find out, you know, some more about this topic and. He came back really quickly, actually, and saying, you know, up in the northern parts of the of the then front line of the war, you know, in 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 Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, they're actually they, they're inviting you to come uh, and see for yourself, and they will happily answer any questions that you have. Uh, so we went together, he and I, uh, and we we visited quite a few uh, state-run orphanages up there, um, but but those are. Uh, they were, as you probably imagine, really inst institutionalized uh, big buildings that were good at taking care of the kids' emotional needs, but maybe not so much their, or oh, excuse me, their physical needs, but, but maybe not their right. emotional needs. So it wasn't, I, I was actually on my way home uh, um, because I, I felt that it would be too sad uh, of a story and I needed, I always make films about hope. Uh, I need that, you know, light in the darkness. That's what inspires me. Um, but then they took me, one of the last days, they took me to Margarita's shelter, and, you know. And the second I stepped over that threshold, uh, yeah, it was small and it was worn out. Uh, but there were kids' drawings on the wall and uh, 
uh, you know, the young kids were running around shouting it, and that was in stark contrast to the other uh, places I've been. And, in, and there was a room where an, an elderly, uh, beautiful lady was, was trying to teach some of the girls music, even though she didn't play herself. And, and Margarita <laughs> was there hugging two kids uh, 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 while she was, you know, telling some parent off, shouting in the phone at the same time. And it just felt, you know, the whole place just oozed of, 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 um, of homeliness or of heart warmth, if that's a word, uh, a comfort. Um, and it was such a contrast that immediately I just, you know, I became so intrigued, you know, what, is it like this every day? And if it is, you know, what makes it so different? Uh, and that's what started me uh, documenting the lives of the, of the kids in, in this, in this shelter. I mean, you really come to care about the kids that, um, you're sh as a viewer, that you're shooting. Yeah. I'm sure you care about them. How, how yeah. long were you there shooting? It shot over the course of roughly one and a half years. And oh, wow. what I do is I would go there for, for every second month for about a week, 10 days, maybe to have it like on a very regular basis so that, that everybody knew, you know, and could trust that I would be back, you know. So, so like if you're, you have a little boy on the phone with his mother finding out that she's drunk or something, and can't come take care of him. Is that you have like a whole crew shooting this little boy at 10 o'clock at night? Or is it just? No, no, no. I do my own cinematography and my own mm. sound. It's like a one man, one army <laughs> type of setup. You know? yeah. uh, that said though, I do have my, my brilliant assistant, Ukrainian director with me, Asad Safarov. So it's just the two of us actually. And, and I think that's very instrumental and in how it's possible to 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 get close to these kids and and to develop that trust and that you know uh, comfort with each other uh, that's needed to capture such raw emotional uh, situations like like we did. Yeah, amazing. It's so beautiful. I I, I couldn't stop thinking about those children <laughs> uh, after I saw the film. Yeah. Um, Daniel, let's talk about Navalny. Unless you want to first show us what you're drawing, because it's really cool. He's very good. <laughs> I'm just drawing what I, I have ADD, and if I don't have this with me, I'll get really antsy and struggle. So please pardon me. It's it's wonderful. You're creating while we're talking about creativity, so that's I'm, pretty great. I have a collection, a series on Chanek, and I'm gonna make a little book for his mom. Oh. <laughs> I've been posing. <laughs> <laughs> That's very cool. That's very cool. Okay, well, I hate to interrupt your drawing, but let's talk about Navalny, which really is c c totally lightning in a bottle that you documented this incredible historic figure before he was shut off to the whole world for we don't know how long. So from what I've read, you started this project f focusing on Bellingcat, this unbelievable set of rogue journalists, Laura can understand what that's about, um, right, who, who were helping him solve the mystery of who had poisoned him? Well, not exactly. Not exactly. Okay. Fix me. Fix my I, statement. I had heard of Bellingcat. I knew what Bellingcat was. They're this great investigative journalist website, and they do these digital online investigations that are quite innovative and, and interesting. Um, and I happened to be making a different film, working on a completely different story with one of the leads at Bellingcat, this guy called Crystal Grozev. And Crystal Grozev and one of the film's producers uh, and myself, we were all in Ukraine working on a film there. But that film wasn't going anywhere, and we were very assertively encouraged to leave the country quickly. And we found ourselves wow. in Vienna in October of 2020, when Crystal very casually proclaimed one morning, that he, he had stumbled upon a lead in the investigation into who tried to poison Navalny. And immediately, that was a light bulb moment. I knew exactly who this guy was, and, and I thought that this would be an extraordinary story. And so it was very much riding on Christo's coattails um, that we were able to go and meet with Alexei, and it was my job to essentially pitch him both on why a documentary was valuable, but why it should be us to make that documentary. And, and I, I was successful in that effort. And it was the, the, one of these, these things where the stars aligned and we started shooting the film immediately. 
knowing full well that Navalny was planning on going back to Russia. This was had always been his prerogative, and and we had. So one minutes. second, you went to pitch the film, and then you just stayed and started making the film. Mm-hmm. We we it was probably November twelfth, twenty twenty, when I first sat across from Navalny in this shadowy little uh, cafe in the Black Forest um, it, of Germany. It had very much the mise en scene of our own little spy movie. Like this is where these 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 type of meetings should take place. And for me, it was I I was naive to the to the risk, and I didn't know what it, you know how scared I should be. I I think that's really why I was able to do it, because I was just sort of moronic about it, and I didn't realize what it meant to be in witness protection, and I didn't at first see Navalny's security detail and all of these things. Um, but we had that first meeting, and. The, 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 it was m sort of my job to convince him the virtues of the medium. This is a man who is a politician, and perhaps his great genius is his mastery of media, his ability to contort uh, social media, YouTube, these sorts of things to further his political messaging. Um, so the question immediately from the very first moment was, how is he going to weaponize us? How are we going to be part of his political brinkmanship? Um, and that, that question was, was on the very forefront of my mind from our very first encounter through to the editing of the movie and everything like this. Meaning that you did not want to be a tool in his toolkit? You well, mean? it was more like being aware that we were a tool in his toolkit. Him inviting us in to make this film was in and of itself a political decision. And his political calculus was that he's going to be traveling back to Russia. There's a high probability he's going to be arrested and he'll be sitting in prison. And he would benefit greatly from some sort of vehicle to keep his name in the global consciousness. And he understood that a film would, would, do, would do that. When, when you met him, he had fully recovered from the poison attack and was just he, plotting he, his return to, he, to Russia, yeah, basically? Yeah, he hadn't fully recovered. No. Um, he still had neurologic damage. Um, he was working on his hand-eye, his coordination, these sorts of things. We see him in the film juggling and trying to, to uh, train and practice his hand-eye coordination. But he was dead set on going back. So it was very clear that however this film unfolded, there was a very clear architecture to the movie. He is going back. That would serve as our natural conclusion. And it was just a question of filling in the blanks and shooting everything we needed before we lost them. Right. So for those who don't need reminding, Navalny was arrested when he went back to Russia at passport control, right? Yeah, his, last, for, his last breath of freedom is depicted in the movie. He, he travels back, he gives us a little speech at the airport, and as he's crossing into Russian territory at passport control, these, these guys in black suits come out and tell him that he is required to come with them for a parole violation that he had apparently committed. Um, the reason he missed his parole uh, uh, appointment was because he was in Germany recovering from a state-sponsored poisoning attack. Um, and the Kafkaesque absurdity of that is very much threaded into the uh, Russian judicial system, if yeah. you can even call it that. So he's been in, in prison ever since. Um, now he finds himself in a particularly dangerous position. He is the only prisoner in the Russian penal system to be in perpetual solitary confinement. He is now? He is right now in a very small cell, and, wow. and these guys will weaponize other prisoners as biological agents, and they'll bring in someone who has tuberculosis or COVID to spend 12 hours in the cell with him. And then, of course, Navalny will get sick, and they'll take him to the prison infirmary, deny him civilian medical care, then they'll inject him with who knows what. We know that in the last month, he's lost about 17 pounds. And last week, there, the thing last week, every week there's a new little torture device, and last week they installed ultra-bright lights in the prison cell. So it's really, it's really painful and very like awful. we did in Guantanamo, probably, but yeah. Very similar. Yeah. Um, do you think he'll survive? Well, uh, I think uh, if anyone could, it would be him. But it's very. I mean, I, I know I'm asking you something you can't possibly know the answer to, but I think it's I don't think none of us. I mean, I was not aware. I've not seen in the press that he that they've been doing this kind of. Yeah, inhumane. I think it's. I think it's a coin toss, honestly. Um, 
one of the subjects of our film, uh, his chief investigator, Maria Pepcek, contextualized it as Navalny's life sentence. Just a question of whose life it is, his or Vladimir Putin's. It's clear that as long as Putin is, is in charge of that country, he will not be let out. Um, and the severity that the regime is acting to just crush his supporters and everything like this, I think really, you know, he made the miscalculation. I would say Navalny uh, had the hubris to go back before he was fully recovered um, and to do it so brazenly, and, and they just took him and they, 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 they crushed everything. He hasn't seen his wife in a year and a half. Uh, it must be getting very, very cold and lonely for him, and it's very painful. Well, he, knows, he certainly would have known that if they were trying to kill him that they would at a minimum put him off in Siberia and he wouldn't be with his family. So I, he certainly might have, would have been prepared for that. But to, to this degree of oh, it's, yeah, that's. Yeah, well, I, I can just speak to that. Uh, it was just every, every day someone says, why did he go back? Laura and I were discussing it yesterday. Why did he go back? And. I think if he were sitting here right now, what he would offer is, as an explanation, whether we accept it or not, is that to stay away is a gift to the Kremlin. To stay out of the country, the way it works in Russia, if you leave the country, if you're in exile, if you're in Berlin or, or Vilnius or Paris or Berlin, um, you are relegated to obscurity. All of the oppositionists who have left have been, have been relevated, relegated to irrelevancy. And Navalny would say that he wants to be the moral leader of the nation and to go back and occupy that space and to be there. He would have the moral platform to ask people to take to the streets and to put their lives at risk and to protest. And he wouldn't be able to do that if he was out of the country. I struggle with that explanation. I have trouble with it. Um, but it's obviously a decision that he had to make between him and his family and his higher power and whatever he believes in. Um, and he was unequivocal about it. And there was no question that that's what his path was. Thank you. Uh, Shauna, you, your film is absolutely beautiful. M many people have talked about the, the beauty of the cinematography uh, work that you did in shooting the story of these kite birds that are being saved one by one. <laughs> it feel, feels like a Sisyphean kind of project of the subjects of your film to, to save these birds, and yet it's very, very beautiful. You chose to do this film because why? Uh, I was thinking a lot about the air. Mm. Um, I think when you live in Delhi, you often think about the air. You're often preoccupied with the air. Um, and I wanted to do something on the texture or tone of life in Delhi. You know, one is constantly, like air just forms a kind of wallpaper of our lives there. Um, apart from that, philosophically, I was interested in thinking of human-animal entanglement. And um, if I had to pinpoint one moment, um, it was this one day where um, Aman, who's sitting there, and I were sat in a car, and um, essentially we um, saw what looked like a bird fall off the sky and you know it's like in the winters when you go to the city it's this classic image of this grey monotone monochromatic kind of an expanse in which there are these tiny black dots and every now and then you f have a sensation of like you know like we felt like we saw one of those black kites plummeting um, and we were just uh, like I was gripped by this figure of a bird that falls off a grey, polluted expanse. And we started looking into what happens when birds fall, fall off the sky. And that's when we chanced upon the work of the brothers. And what they do is singular and remarkable. And, um, uh, you know, for the last 15 years, they've treated almost 25,000 black kites in a tiny, grubby, decaying, industrialized basement. It's crazy. It's really, and it felt like there are three Don Quixotes, you know, who are trafficking in micro miracles. And, uh, but most of all, I mean, I, I did not, we did not want to make a sweet film about nice people doing good things, uh, but make something which was, uh, you know, denser conceptually and cinematically and so on. But it was also a very cinematically dense space. So uh, we were just very uh, seduced by the form and the conceptual bulwark of it. 
and that's how it started and then you know it's a, fi- a film is like very often like a fever dream right you jump off a cliff and um it took us 3 years but you know it's like after up, you don't really have control over uh, when it ends or um it just like takes a sort of life of its own well th- in particularly in your story because there's not really a beginning middle and end unless you start with the industrial revolution which would be i mean there is an difficult. end uh, there is isn't when you run out of money is the end. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, uh, um, Fair it, it was a fairly hard line for us um uh, but uh, yes i mean in the sense that uh, one wasn't thinking chronologically and um uh, very often we were shooting what was the end and the, like that kind of a thing it was completely mishmashed but um and a large part of the structural logic of the film was on the edit but actually i don't want to like that's not very irreducibly specific to me i'm sure with a lot of films and most like docs often like the edit Uh, you know you're constantly paying obeisance at the altar of intention and obstacle with character and sometimes you find the moment in the edit and sometimes you have to shoot it so um uh, that's not very singular to me i want to ask uh, all you guys what how you think of being a documentary filmmaker today i would argue that it's the primary filmmaking is the primary way of communicating what's going on in our time and I'm a writer so I say that sadly that what I do has pales in comparison to what the, the impact that y- what you do has on the world as we've seen from many documentary films and yet at the same time it's such a crowded space there's so many documentaries being made and how do you, you know so when you embark on a documentary I just wonder how how it feels to be working in that space when it's hard to know if that work will be s- widely seen just because there's so there's so many places to see films but there's so so many films to see. Anybody have a thought on that? I guess I can maybe start and just say um, I feel really grateful for Fire of Love being uh, widely seen right now. Um, it's the first time I've had a film that has been widely seen, so I know what it's like to not have a film that's widely seen. Uh, my first two independent films that I made, um, The Last Season and The Seer and the Unseen, they were labors of love, uh, and I feel really grateful that they had a robust life on the film uh, festival circuit and were very well regarded by critics, but we had a very difficult time getting distribution. Um however my team and I uh we couldn't not make them. They were films so infused kind of with our own passion for them and stories that we so believed needed to be told. And those are very different films. <clears throat> yet they share kinship with uh Fire of Love in that they're all about the human relationship with non-human nature. They're not advocacy environmental films, but they do center a love of nature in a way that I do think is a small act of repair on a totally ravaged uh planet that we live on um so I'll just say uh while they're not yeah not explicitly political there is a politics behind them um and making them um with the wonderful team that I worked with and with the subjects in the film it it felt like a medicine to me um I felt like I had my dream job even though I, I was making those films on nights and weekends <laughs> and producing other other projects uh, for other people as my my day job so I'll just say um it's it's a very crowded lo- landscape and i personally feel so lucky that we're in this age where we can see such extraordinary films like like the ones here today um but, but for me personally I, i guess like i'm i'm so grateful for uh for fire of love being out and wide but i i'm just going to continue to make the work that means so much to me and and my collaborators um even if it's seen by only a handful of people on the film festival circuits or have the great honor of having it um uh, be you know put up by national geographic the way fire of love has Anybody else? I mean, this description of fever dream, I think, is sort of good. I mean, I think compelled, obsessed. I mean, you have to really like love. You have to just feel like it has a gravitational pull towards you, and you end hopefully that you can translate that to an audience. I don't. I think that has to be like. I consider what we make. I think that I consider myself an artist, and I consider everybody here artists. And that's we you know we we express ourselves, and we're driven to do that. so it would it wouldn't have mattered <laughs> if people saw it or didn't see it <laughs> no of course it matters i mean of course it matters but i also think 
there are films that I love that may, that don't get seen by a wide audience. I mean, yeah, you know, like right. very avant-garde cinema that I love. Like that. Um, so, uh, and I want those films to be in the world too. So, yes, of course, it's wonderful to have um, to have an audience. But it's also um, I. I I, I, there are so many films that I could say that you know very few people have seen um, and that that I'm that are sort of pushing the boundaries of cinema in ways that I I, I love yeah anybody else go ahead Shanik yeah uh, well uh, I've never made a film that's been distributed and I've never made a film that has uh, it, the last one that we made um, uh, didn't even have a robust life in film festivals, so <laughs> the baseline was fairly uh, low. Um, and actually, the thing is that uh, at least when we are making it, you know, you make something because it doesn't exist, and you don't really think of like at least I at any rate don't really think of the audience um, at all, actually, because uh, I've never had an audience. Uh, so you know you don't you work and it's not a vacuum it's nice in the sense that you then think of and but now maybe in from the next film it'll be a different uh, answer but the scale of the audience and the reach of the film this time is truly nothing of what Aman and I could have ever conceived of like uh, right from the first day of Sundance to today afternoon we've sat across the room and said what is happening you know so it's a um, it, there's, there have been scalar jumps that have felt utterly inconceivable, but uh, you know you b make things because you something in the image is nice and uh, something in the story seems interesting, but not with a, at least I don't have a, a concrete conception of an audience at all. Simon, you look like you're, you're shaking your head or something. So, so I'm gonna. No, it's, I, I completely agree with Shanek. Uh, for me, it's 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 a curiosity. It's it's a, I I have to you know think uh, that 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 this story you know it intrigues me and and it makes me want to exp uh, explore the adventures that 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 you know that it kind of um, hides so to speak. I think. Doing it the, the other way around, starting thinking, you know, could this be a good film for to 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 uh, to get out there in the world and have a huge a huge audience? That that would be a completely wrong thing to do. You, you have to, in my uh, opinion, you have to have a, a personal need uh, to to go the places and see the people and and start, you know, uh, forming friendships and relationships and to to make that kind of. Uh, of documentary and the other way around it would be a strange uh, cold way of uh, um, of making film which i think it's probably not really successful either yeah interesting i mean and yet the films have such a big impact on the world particularly daniel your film really came at it at a moment when uh you know he when alexi naval is being arrested and this is a window into who the man is that we would really never have otherwise seen. I mean, you can see his YouTube videos and that kind of thing, but you know, he's smart, he's funny, he's charismatic, he's brave to the point of foolishness if, if, you're, if you're to be <laughs> believed. So did, when, when you made it, did you think, I gotta get this out into the world? I gotta get everybody to see this? Well, uh, yeah, we wanted people to see the movie as we were making it, certainly. Yeah. Um, but when we were making the film, when we were editing the film, we had no concept. Uh, that this war would start. It wasn't on the horizon. All of the, the Russian experts who were involved with the movie th said that it's not going to happen. And then the war started three weeks after the film premiered. Um, and obviously that was sickening um, and uh, awful and brutal. And, and in that moment, I, I thought that our already important film had to be released into the world immediately. And, and we did not have the luxury of waiting or planning a summer release like like we had hoped it just became a question of getting the film out into the world immediately because the thought was that navalny exists now in a very dangerous place if they're launching this war why don't they just rip off the band-aid and uh, take out all of their adversaries at the same time it'd be very easy for them to murder navalny he is in the custody of, of the same men who tried to murder him once already and so then it became a question of whether or not releasing the film 
would help at all. And what we decided is that if we can keep his name in the global consciousness, even a small amount, 5%, 10%, yeah. just a little bit of exposure, maybe that will dissuade the regime from murdering him. Maybe, as I like to call it, the pain in the ass index of killing him in prison uh, will be a little bit too high, and instead of killing him, they'll say, we'll just torture him. We'll just let him languish. Um, and I don't, I don't, I don't th claim that our film attributed to the fact that he's still alive. I think it's many small stones cast. Um, but I do believe that keeping his name in the global consciousness is, is meaningful intervention in a way. Um, but for me, the most inspiring part of this, I think, is for the, the dozens and dozens and dozens of, of young Russians who have approached me after screenings. These are young men and women who have been, who have left their country, who have fled, who feel disillusioned and, and are sickened by this war, who have left behind their families, who are ashamed to be Russian, who are ashamed of their nationality. And they see our film, and they see the Navalny, and they see their guy. And for a brief moment, a lot of these people experience a small flicker of hope in a sea of endless darkness. And a lot of people are moved by that. Um, and it certainly has, has moved me. And, and I think that's very meaningful. Jonathan. Um, I do want to take a moment and ask each of you as filmmakers um, if there's something, either one or the other, that was particularly challenging that you had to overcome in your production, and, or if there's something that you were particularly proud of that you want to point out and say, this was something I was trying to do and we managed to do it. Either or. Laura? <laughs> you have to think about it. Yeah. Sarah? Uh, <coughs> sure, I'll, I'll attempt it at this. Or, and you, or you can answer both, either um, one or I, both. I guess I would say, actually, I, I think the thing I'm proudest of is how the challenges, and there are myriad challenges in making Fire of Love, turned into creative opportunities. And, and I'm, I'm very proud, actually, of my team and I for working through that. It, it's very hard. Um, in making any film to, to trust that from all, all of the pieces, all of the stories, all of the footage, somehow it will come together. Um, and particularly when you see these ob obstacles that feel insurmountable, yeah, <laughs> you can, it can cause, at least for me, a feeling of true existential dread. <laughs> but s learning through the process of making Fire of Love that really on the other side of those challenges were opportunities and, and then being able to trust that that actually is the case um, well, can you give us an example? Absolutely, yeah. For um, I guess the, the easiest example is that the tw 200 hours of 16 millimeter footage that Katya and Marie shot um, came to us without any sound. <laughs> it was silent footage. Oh, wow. And in any film, of course, sound is, is a critical component, but particularly in a film where uh, volcanoes are just as much as characters as, as Katya and Maurice, and where we're trying to create a portraiture of the earth where it's alive and sentient, sound is such an important tool in, in doing that. Um, and at once we're making a science film and it has to be accurate and factual. And so we were tasked with doing an extraordinary amount of research. Um, this was led by my amazing editors, Aaron Casper and Jocelyn Chaput, who did painstaking research um, with uh, libraries, uh, sound libraries, um, s geothermal libraries even, uh, to wow. find the right sounds for not just the volcanoes, but also to make Katya and Maurice feel uh, intimate and seen, um, you know, because your attention goes where the sound is amid these vast and majestic landscapes. Um, and uh, I think that they did so very successfully. Um, in some ways, if we had sound that actually came with the 16 millimeter footage, there wouldn't have been the same kind of opportunities for play. Um, one thing we like to talk about in Fire of Love is that there's the scientific fact, and there's also the truth, which can be quite different actually from fact, and there's the truth of Katya and Maurice's perception. And for them, they were so enchanted by volcanoes and saw them really as alive. And it was so important to get at that feeling uh, through the sound. Um, there's one example of a scene where, uh, where uh, I kind of like to, to just like show how, how that came into being. 
um, in Indonesia in 1979, Katyn Reis visited a volcano called Anak Krakatau, which was particularly monstrous. And Erin, one of my editors, when she was putting together that scene, um, she of course had like the, the scientific you know, explosion sounds of volcanoes, but she found uh, sound effects entitled dinosaur sound effects. <laughs> and she edited wow. with the, what's that? I'm just, I just oh. said, wow. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she very subtly uh, wove those in and it added kind of this hint of monstrosity uh, that felt true to Katya and Reese's perception. And that kind of creativity, uh, yeah, uh, if, if the sound had been there, if that obstacle had been removed, we might have not been able to have that opportunity for play. And it's something that I like to think of, you know, Katya and Maurice on their volcano in the sky um, being am amused by things like that and that feeling uh, akin with their own um, spirit. So um, that, was, that was one example, but there's tremendous challenges in trying to tell a love story out of these beautiful pieces, but many, many, many pieces of, of footage. It's a great example, thank you. Who else? Daniel, yes. Um, I forgot what you asked, but I have an answer. <laughs> Th that'll work. Um, for me, I think the, the I, I, if I had to think of how I grew as a filmmaker making the Navalny film, I would very much frame that in the exercise of removing my own ego from the process, which I found to be very hard. But with counsel and patience from the entire producing team, but primarily the film's editors, um, Langdon Page and Maya Daisy Hawk, uh, I, I really feel that I was able to sort of step back um, and remember that the film is God and it's the ultimate. And we had moments in the edit where Maya or Langdon would share something with me and I would immediately break out in a rash. I would hate it so much. And they would challenge me to sleep on it and to think about it narratively and cinematically and think about why we should leave it in. And what I came to realize is, is the value and the skill of a great director is being able to do just that, to realize that your own ideas aren't always the best and being able to appropriate and accept the ideas of your collaborators. Um, is, th is there an example you can recall of something they said, let's not include yeah, uh, this? Yeah, uh, the, the most vivid one for me, uh, one of the greatest challenges when we were editing the film is how do you open the movie? Where do we start this story? And that was sort of the white whale of the editorial process, where to begin. And we had tried every iteration, everything we could think of, every out-of-the-box idea. And one morning, Maya showed me a version of the movie that started on an interview. And she hit play, and I said, before I even watched it, I said, Maya, are you fucking crazy? You wanna open this on an inner, like, and she, she snapped at me. She, can, she has crocodile teeth, and she snapped at me this <laughs> morning, and she said, Daniel, can you just watch it? And, this, and I got scared, and so <laughs> I watched it, and I couldn't, stand. I was like, this, no, we're not, you're opening the film on my voice in an interview, are you crazy? And then she said, just take it, go for a walk, take a beat, like let's, let's consider it. And so I did, and I came back, and we watched it again, and, and somehow the second time I watched it, uh, it, it felt a little less abrasive. Yeah. And then I thought it was funny, because Navalny was telling me off, and it very much speaks to how our relationship was. I would say something, and he'd roll, roll his eyes at me. I mean, it'll probably end up being the most iconic piece of the film. That just a few seconds of that. I, him I, rolling I would his predict. eyes at me. Just, just your voice off the distance and him looking at the it, camera. It, it, you know. it could be, and and it was such a strong character moment from him, yeah. and it really teed up sort of the meta narrative of the movie. This question of who's directing who, which we all thought was very fascinating, and the sort of intellectual pedigree of that whole part of the movie, you know, didn't come from this dodo. It came from. Langdon and Maya, who just took my vision and, and, and the filtration of what I was thinking and put it on a rocket ship and totally elevated it. And getting to work with the two of them, I think they're two of the finest documentary editors in the world, I really got to see the difference of what it is to work with pros and, and wow. how the greatest thing I can do is get out of my own way. Amazing. Um, the main challenge really was form and um, grammar because we, uh, like I was saying earlier, we initially decided that we won't let it become a wildlife or a nature doc. Uh, we won't let it become a conventionally political doc. 
and we won't let it become sentimental as much as we could like we try our best to not let it become modern because there is a version of that film so the main kind of in one sentence the main struggle was to find a form that feels like it's placed between fiction and non fiction where we take tools from the toolkit of fiction in terms of shape in terms of the aesthetic container of it where of course we don't tell characters what to do but we use tracks and dollies and on occasion cranes and so on so the outer shape feels like it's an aesthetic object which feels almost fictive um but the action but what people are doing is of course utterly authentic so i think the main really the main um arm wrestle every day was to find a form and a film vocabulary that would be beautiful while um holding on to some sense of truth and is able to you know have a fine balance but where was the day where you said i got it the first 6 or 7 months we were actually shooting handheld and um you know that was more conventionally verite but the thing is that if you um handheld often feels a bit anxious and restless at times whereas the characters were very contemplative and meditative and philosophically alive and the form had to uh, you know the zeitgeist of the form had to mirror what the characters were like and then we decided okay no we have to be on a tripod like these ones but then we thought that okay let's between two tripods put a slider and move it all day long then so it was a slow accretion of and it moved towards a shape of something that resembled later how some fiction films are shot i don't like this because in in my putting it like this it sounds like i'm propping up a binary exclu- uh, like a exclusive uh, sorry I completely garbled the words there like a binary between fiction and non fiction in terms of form but usually those kinds of devices are used for fiction because they require time and here we had the advantage that it was a tiny space where the same action was happening every day man brings kites in boxes they get looked at in a tiny basement get taken to the uh, terrace afterwards so then we could try and play with form really so i think after 6 or 8 months when we realized that handheld was just not working and aman said but we have three hard drives full of footage already uh, but we had to sort of take a call where we decided that we had to junk it Oh and, my god. Uh, and uh, after I think 7 months we began essentially um with uh, the new style which was always tripoded or on a slider or you know and no handheld stuff at all and you can't have both in the film right so I think that's when the new form sort of developed. Y- you are you are a very patient man. Oh my god. <laughs> But that's amazing. It must be amazing when you feel like okay this is working. Uh, yeah, I mean also once you've decided it this way then you can't really go back to handheld, right? Those two don't uh, yeah. can't get married at can't all. Can't talk to each other. At all. So once you've done it and once a new hard drive has been bought then that's uh, That's it. You know, that's uh, your on a uh, course then. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Simon. Uh, a challenge or something you were proud of? Either or or both. This is this has obviously been a very difficult film to make and there's been quite a lot of really hardcore challenges and 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 things to to ponder but I think you know spending so much time with with these kids there were so many of them that really touched me and the crew uh, uh their stories and they all seemed equally as important and we were filming a lot of them you know um So when it came down to the editing one of the hard decisions to make was that we discovered that if we included too many of their stories we wouldn't have simply practically we wouldn't have the time as an audience to to get close personally or to feel that we were getting really personally close to to the main characters enough for us to to really begin to sympathize and and start to have a feeling to get to know them to be interested in their lives and and to care for them so so what we had to do was we had to cut off f- some stories and that was a very hard thing to do um for for the whole to to work more more powerful and and so it wouldn't become too voyeuristic but more engaging and that you would feel that you really got close uh, to these precious kids you know wow well that's both a challenge and something you're proud of so wow 
Laura, you want to bring it home? You, 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 were you able to come I up with something? Or? Up, but I'll, I'll try <laughs> to answer it. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I guess the, 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 the piece of the part of the film that I'm most proud of is the, the emotional depth. And again, that goes back to the collaboration with Nan. Um, and the collaboration with the editors. It's funny because uh, Maya Hawk, who's the editor of Daniel's films, partners with Joe Beanie, who was one of the editors of my film. So there's like, there's like lots of dialogues. And Aaron Casper is the editor. Um, Sarah's film I've worked with. And, um, but the, the, the being able to um, yeah, make a film that really, that, that has both the kind of the, uh, a powerful political message, but then um, the emotional depth. And, and navigating that was not easy, you know, like how not to exploit, to go places. I mean, you know, this is Nan's work. Nan goes to really intense places. And, and, to, and one of the things she always talks about is, okay, this is about destigmatizing certain issues. So if you talk about certain things that, um, that society likes to stigmatize, it's like it's a very delicate, you can do an edit of something and it really doesn't work. And you really, how do you, how do you tackle some of these topics and, and navigate them? And so, um, so uh, yeah, very proud of, of that collaboration. I mean, I can talk about one specific, could be like Nan made the decision to talk about sex work in the film. And that was something that she, she said that she felt it was something she wanted to, um, to, to include in the film to destigmatize it, you know, and it, but is one of those how how the the edit there was you know there's the f you know there was one cut and I was like no it's not we have to like we have to approach it differently um, and uh, yeah so this col collaboration with great editors and and I'm also proud that the the film has a capacity um, to to meet that you meet people in a deep way beyond Nan that like so for instance David Wonorovich and yeah. that the film hat was strong enough at that point in the film where you really can s really spend a lot of time with with a character you're meeting late in the film and th and that the film is still able to sort of go take go back to the road that it's on and, um, with the audience so yeah collaborating and and, and making I mean I'm thinking about like all the similarities there's like some resonances between the films here and I, what I love about um, Simon's film, and one of the things is that you meet a character and then they're gone, and you know you're not going to meet them, you know, and which is like there's there's sometimes there's a you sort of an interweaving, and every every f character feels like it has to arc, and 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 I don't think that that's how life works, and and I think that that's really uh, the, the structure of, of of the film is really powerful that we lose somebody really early in the film, one of the children leaves, and you fall in love with them and they're gone, and and then we meet new new characters and um, I'm just really interested in sort of like grammar form like um, to think like what's what's possible and and I mean I think with um, all that breathes I mean I think every fiction filmmaker should watch it because of its use of dialogue and subtext and its patience you know it's just so beautifully crafted so well I'm sadly we're out of time but thank you so much for sharing what an amazing conversation Laura Poitras Sarah Doss Daniel Rohr Shonak Sen and Simon Wimple. Thank you so much, and um, thanks for coming, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.